Hello and welcome to the Undercut Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Jesse Billington, and we are back to preview this weekend's Mexican Grand Prix. And when I say we, I mean all three of us, as I am joined by none other than Mr. Timo Albus Daly and Miss Ellie Mae Taylor. How are you both? Uh, well, I forgot that it was Wednesday and that I had a podcast until a couple of hours ago, so that's where my head's at. Good, good. It's an excellent starting place. Timo, did you remember we were recording today? Yes, I was aware that it was Wednesday, so I had a bit more of a head start than Eddie May did, which uh, it's just how these things happen sometimes. It's We've all had those days where you think it's a day or two earlier or later than what it is, and you forget that you might be somewhere that you're not at that moment of time, so it happens. In terms of Mexico... I don't know. It's one of those weird seasons. This might actually be a good race. Mm. You had, in fact, been informed that it is Wednesday, my dudes. Um, But yes, Mexico looms ever closer and the racing action returns to... Oh, this is a terrible... uh, Circuit... Oh, Manos Rodriguez, isn't it? That's it. I remember the circuit name just the last second there. But before we get to the racing action in Mexico City... I did. Yes, I did, because I was doing a little bit of note writing earlier today. Um... Before we jump into the racing action that is to come this weekend, we might as well have a quick look at FP1. And there is a whole host of FP1 special drivers coming in this weekend. Uh, At the time of recording, at least, this is correct. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe another one or two crop up as Mexico is a common spot for them to appear. Uh, For stake, we have Robert Schwartzman hopping in the car, which must suck if you're Teo Porcher, not even getting a look in at the team that paid for your final F2 season. Uh, Ferrari have got Oli Behrman back in the car. Mercedes, Kimi Antonelli now in place of Lewis Hamilton. McLaren have got Pato Award and Aston Martin have got Felipe Drogovic. And uh, Timo has asked, can we get a 1980s style opening with additional photo stills of these guest drivers? That would be fun. I doubt it. It's Formula One. Their levels of creativity rarely extend beyond the obvious. Um, it's the frustrating element here. If I have excellent social media ideas, I just don't have the capacity to create them. Mm. Hindered by your own inabilities. Truly a shame. I was born in the wrong decade. What can I say? I was I was born to appreciate social media, not be a, someone who creates it. Yeah, born just outside of the wrong. I don't know what to, would be the right decade for that. Either way, um, it does pose the question: Who do we expect to actually be a full time F one driver off of this list? Obviously, Antonelli and Behrman are already ticked off. Um, Schwartzman, I don't think he's got a hope at this point in time. He's very much. I was going to cut you short and just say none of them because this yeah. is where I was kind of curious as to. I understand that you've got to put young drivers in but normally you've got a bit of an eye with them coming up like with Anthony with them and we've seen it with others before Colo Pinto being a good example admittedly we didn't expect it at the time and a few others but Schwarzman he's been doing FB1s for as long as we can remember at this point and we know he's not going to get anywhere near an F1 seat Pato same with McLaren it's nice that your pals with Zach and that you can get in every now and again especially in your home race but What's it really doing aside from keeping some sponsors happy? Drogovic, again, he's going to turn to Schwarzman if he's not careful. So I know that you need reserve drivers and you need to put them in occasionally, but should we be putting in drivers that actually have a shot? And if they don't, why are you having them as your pest drive? You know what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, this is where I'm sort of beginning to wonder whether or not we're going to get Hajar reappear in the Alpha Tauri stake again, because, I don't know, it, he was all right when he ran last time, or did he suffer massive technical failures? I can't remember. Not as bad as Antonelli. No. He's no. just got to make it more than one lap this time, and he's already lapping, so... Yeah, he's already doing well. But yeah, Isaac Hajar would be an interesting one, especially if the early rumours coming out of Mexico are to be believed. Um... Liam Lawson will be replacing Sergio Perez and Isaac Hadja will be stepping up to sit next to uh, Yuki Sonoda next season, which is... Amusingly, on the day that uh, Perez's father said he's going to be world champion, no one's told him the maths. That makes him the second most delusional prime minister president of an American nation at the moment. I know, possibly third. I'd have lost track of my delusional American leaders at the moment. Probably best you steer clear of that one. Mm. Yeah, I figured I'd cut that anecdote short there. But it, besides the buy, I mean, there's still a lot to be discovered. There's still a lot of teams that haven't even run um, FP1 drivers yet, Stake being one of them, so that's why they've obviously dusted off a Robert Schwartzman. But otherwise, you're just sort of looking at them going... You mentioned the Abu Dhabi. If it's not announced who's going to be in their second seat and they just mistake, they run Colapinto. Pinto. <sighs> 
I mean, just as a bit of a. I mean, this Colop, is as close to a hint as you're getting. <laughs> Colapinto is also being rumoured bounced around for that other RB seat as well, purely on the grounds of he's quick and knows what he's doing in a Formula 1 car. But, I don't know, it's one of those things that are just so open at the moment, no one really knows, and it's Red Bull, we don't really know what they're up to at the best of times. But anyway... Plot twist is you keep and Perez gone for next year and you're just good there scratching your head going, how did this happen? I was, it was, I didn't think we'd be here 12 months ago. Yeah, that would be a very interesting one. Uh, speaking of, uh, on the other side of this, though, seats that we do know are going to people uh, is the Formula E all-women test, and we've got some more drivers and teams announcements. Nissan have announced they'll be running Sophia Flush and Abby Pulling, while uh, Bites Gavissa and Jess Edka will be driving for DS Penske. So, uh, again, some familiar names if you've enjoyed Formula 3 or uh, F1 Academy or W Series, going back to Bites Gavissa there. Um, so we've got some, yeah, really really good talent sort of again surfacing on this one some recognizable names and some drivers that really need to be looking for sort of series to progress into this is what i think will be the good thing for sophia flush if she can prove her worth over here this would be the the step she needs to get out of a bottom tier f3 team into actually competing in something you were asking me the other day when we were reviewing austin about one of the drivers that had been announced in one of the teams i'm trying to think who it was now because you'd forgotten about them. And this is exactly the same way I'd felt when I saw the DS Penske announcement earlier. It was like, oh, yeah, but well, it's still running around somewhere. I'd forgotten about her. Good. I'm glad she's getting another chance to, to have a go in something. Um, so, like you say, all familiar names gives Flirt another option. There's a lot of talk at the moment that she will get that step up into Formula 2, but with there still being a couple of seats around i think for formula e for next season still even though that's gonna close up shortly because their season obviously starts a lot sooner than than everyone else's uh not a bad way for us to try and get in somewhere especially somewhere like nissan um and pulling again she was at the finale in london having a look nose around so good for her to just keep her options open as well and just it's good same because i think she's in her second season of one academy now as well so she needs to find something to do for next year because it can't be that um, so nice for them all really keeping their options open did Jess Edgar run in F1 Academy last year? yeah she did Yeah, pretty yeah. sure Yeah. yeah. Um, was it uh, Gabriella Yulkova that I was thinking of from uh, Kota? yes yeah another name that you go oh yeah so uh, yeah again Bites Convista lovely to have her back when does oh, they've, got, they've got their testing soon when does the Formula E season actually January January but I was just going to say how, I mean, if you've got someone in F1 Academy at the minute, how much oh, would it cost? December. Actually... December 7th, Sao Paulo, Brazil, first round. Oh, yeah. They're doing a weird thing again. Yeah, their testing is 4th, 7th November, Valencia, Spain, and then they go to Sao Paulo for the December 7th, and then it's Mexico City for January 11th, and then February 14th and 15th is Diria, Saudi Arabia. Then there's still a TBC, actually, round five, March 8th, unknown. I don't know if that's just to come as a surprise or genuinely they haven't actually booked anywhere yet. Wait, they're very well, good at we, doing that, though. I'm never sort of... There's usually one of those a season, isn't there, where we're not yeah. entirely sure until about two, three weeks before. And when, when is that, did you say, March or April? That was in uh, March, March 8th. Well, everyone's going down under. Let's just get it all done with him. Put Formula E there as well. I mean... There we go. Oh, no, they've already done Saudi Arabia, suggesting because they'll be. Uh, I was going to say they could do um, the track that F1 does for Saudi as opposed to the Diria track, but they could go to Jeddah. But uh, we'll wait and see what but, happens. But that means, you know, someone like Abby Pulling could go from F1 Academy to Formula E. Yeah, she, cool. she wouldn't have finished her, form, her F1 Academy season, would she? Before uh, e. Yeah, there is a one weekend overlap because they're racing in yeah. Abu Dhabi, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Mm. So, yeah, it's on the right Dhabi. side of the planet, so it's not too inconvenient. Uh, oh, no, sorry, I completely got mixed no. up there with where I thought everything was. It's yeah. Wednesday, none of it lines up at all. So, um, the fingers crossed there's some contingency plans for i was thinking uh, about mexico <laughs> that's why people taking part in this we'll see how it pans out either way some fantastic names re-emerging for formula e and we look forward to them doing relatively well at the test actually certainly um 
Abby Pulling, it'd be interesting to see how well she's able to transfer her already very good single-seater skills. Looking ahead more accurately than to Mexico, and uh, this will be Fernando Alonso's 400th start in a Grand Prix this weekend, which is a ridiculous milestone to reach and quite a fantastic one, really. Uh, I don't think I think that's the the new record. That's like he's the most. Yeah, well, he overtook driver. Kimi a while yeah. ago, and Lewis then overtook Kimi not too long ago, but he can't catch the record until Alonso stops, and even then he's got to go on for a bit. So you do wonder. And there was a comment I saw um, the other day some with, with the F one film that if Brad Pitt can be realistically portrayed as racing in his sixties, we've got Alonso for a good while still. So Hamilton's a bit buggered on that front. Yeah, I mean, what really wants to know is, hang on a second, let me just check. Uh, Martin Brundle, how old is he? Because he is 65 and he recently ran in one of the modern F1 cars. Mm. So if he's able to punch out a time that's respective, we could have Alonso for another, what, 20 years? And we also might get you to eat your words because you were complaining heavily at the time about how realistic it was that Brad Pitt was supposed to be um, a driver coming back to race in F1 and then suddenly everyone just slowly went, we don't like this, Mr. Billington, saying these things. We're going to go and slowly prove him wrong. If Martin Brundle does prove me wrong, <laughs> I'm willing to eat my words. However, it is quite a big caveat to expect 65-year-old Martin Brundle to get into a modern Formula One car and pull, like, multiple Gs. I will the caveat with the fact that he had a... In this scenario, where he's just doing, like, a one-off thing. This isn't going through, like, a rigorous mess. We need to get back into it. So you've got to take that into account before you well, start okay, doing right, any yeah. potential slander. I will fax I that in when I come to watch the F1 film next year and accurately critique I just it. want you to actually enjoy it rather than being yourself with it. I will enjoy it. I can put that aside. I will then simply go back and watch it again through my normal lens of, sort of, critique. I know there are different times. But how old was um? Oh, his name has literally just escaped me. Nicky Lando. No, how old was Fangio when he won his last? He was in his fifty-four, 50, 50, I think. Wasn't he? Fifty. Fangio 50 was born. He was born in nineteen eleven, and he won his last title in nineteen fifty-seven. So that would make it six. He was forty-six when he won his final title. That's not far away from where Fernando Alonso is now, but also, again, the physicality of driving required different skills. Sort of like when you look different at different times, you not just hear her. Yeah. So, therefore, it's still doable. <sighs> it's and doable, but also irrelevant. I, well, kind of, but then Fernando Alonso is in great physicality he's got great fitness i mean they've said that his body and mind are far younger than his actual age and i mean his 400th grand prix is probably going to be a bit forgettable so his 500th grand prix needs to be spectacular i mean at the rate of the expansion of seasons that will be within the next two to three years yeah so it's we'll, we'll wait and see we'll wait and see Anyway, 400th Grand Prix, that's what we've got to look forward to. And also, the way things are looking, Max Verstappen is likely to win the driver's title, but Red Bull could slip to P3 in the constructors. And the last time we saw that style of result was Nelson Piquet in 1983 with Brabham. And it really does make you ask, how bad was his teammate that year? Ricardo Patrese suffered 10 retirements, exhaust failure, water leak, spun, electrical failure, engine failure, brake failure, gearbox failure, turbo failure, second engine failure, third engine failure, three non-point finishes, and then a third place and a win to accrue 13 points. PK won on 59 points that year for context. Ferrari won the Constructors' title on 89 points, with Brabham on 72 and Renault between them on 79. So, yeah. Not not, you know the only other time in history that a similar thing has happened. Ooh. In what? In, in terms, terms of the driver the wins, but driver that won, but the constructor was n- well, not necessarily P three, but wasn't first or second. Ooh. So if I whipping these kind of facts out now, I might as well take a bit of. Is a, it, go on, whip uh, your facts is it more recent than we think? Depends when you're thinking. Um, I'm going to hazard a guess that we're still we're looking somewhere around the '90s, and it's going to be like a Schumacher Benetton thing. Billy Murray. 
I want a clue. No. Why? Do I need to go more recent or older against Schumacher and Benetton? You've guessed. You you guessed. You're done. Oh. Higher no, but... or lower? Higher or lower than Jesse? <laughs> yeah, but I was trying to get a clue there for any men. Lower. So more recent. No. Oh, older. Opposite lower. So, oh, eighties. Oh, I'm going to say the year one of the, maybe the year that Keki Rosberg won. Around about then. What date was that? Nineteen eighty. Three, two. I was going to say so you just named 1983, Jesse, so it's not going to be that year, is it? No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so... It's Wednesday. Leave me alone. <laughs> One year in history, it definitely isn't. Uh... Ellie, may I'm going to stop you right there because and he's going to be annoyed now. It was 1982. It was KK Rosberg. It was Williams. They finished in P4 that year. And uh, Ferrari were the ones to win the constructors and McLaren Ford and P2 and Renault and P3 but Ellie May just showing that she's a better F1 historian than Jesse is so <sighs> them's the brakes that's annoying I mean I oh, I was close but you were wrong no and in yes. the wrong decade, I mean I had a get I had a clue kind of like, this is it. this is why I didn't want to give you a clue <laughs> Because well, you thought I would get correctly. Kecky Rosberg anyway. <laughs> it, am I wrong? No, this is exactly <laughs> what you then did. I can imagine How Jesse would... just editing this all out now and then just saying... No, I'm curious as to who Rosberg's teammate was, as to how badly he must have done. Well, no, because Kecky Rosberg only won one race, wasn't it? The, the Williams weren't dominant. They were just reliable against the sort of Renault and Ferrari engines. Oh, well, no, he didn't have just one teammate either. He had Carlos Reutemann for the first two, Mario Andretti yeah, for the third Derek round, Daly and then Derek and Daly for the final yeah. few rounds. So the net result is that he not only did he easily beat all of his teammates, it just meant that, yeah, they never sort of accrued, the second Williams just never really accrued any points. Uh, a fifth, a disqualified, a second... A second a retirement, a fourth a retirement, a third a retirement, a fifth, a third, a second, a first, an eighth, and a fifth. So, how the, how the Blazers did PK win that? Then it's still it's back PK, it's Rosberg. Rosberg. It's Wednesday, leave me alone. Uh, anyway, fun history facts out the way. Um, You've got a question I have for another us, question. For another you. question. Yes. Is it as uh, mind scrambling as the last one? I was going to say, I've used, my, already. I've, used my, I've used my one brain cell. That's it for the day. <laughs> no, no, this, this doesn't require that kind of thought. Don't worry. I thought, as there's not much news, I might actually try and preview a bit of Mexico, as we sometimes forget to do that aside from predictions, which is fair enough because we've got more things to talk about sometimes. But as it's Mexico, Grumpy, I'm curious about what you do think on this one. We say this about drivers sometimes, that they're nice people, but when it comes to the racing, that doesn't mean that they'll be a good driver. With Mexico, the atmosphere, which I'm guessing none of us have been, unless we've one of us wants to, to tell the other two something, um, looks pretty damn good on TV. The track isn't awful. It's a nice kind of blend of a track in a street circuit with obviously the great stadium section. But for me, is it the kind of circuit equivalent of a nice driver but then isn't actually good for Grand Prix and racing because I can't remember the last time we had a Mexican Grand Prix or for that matter uh, a Mexican E-Prix where I've had my socks absolutely knocked off uh, the only thing I can think of is the Formula E race which maybe you will have this only because I can't think who it was now it might have been Degrassi where he won literally pipping on the line on the inside to in the very last lap when whoever it was ahead of him thought they were taking the win, but that was obviously a different category. Whereas here, we have moments occasionally, but I don't remember the last time we had a truly memorable Mexican Grand Prix. I'm that stuns them into silence. I'm tempted to say 2021, because I was watching it back the other day, and it was a race packed with what can only be described as Max Verstappen shithousery. Because this is obviously the incredible battle between Verstappen and Hamilton across the season for the title. Verstappen is a crew and fastest lap for this race. Mercedes think, ah, 
will shore up Hamilton's championship challenge by pitting Bottas because he'd been spun around on lap one by Ricardo. Mm. Pit Bottas, put him on soft, send them out. He'll get the fastest lap. He'll take it away from Verstappen. We'll have it for the constructors, but it's one point that Max won't have against Lewis. But Verstappen knows that. And unfortunately, the first time Mercedes released Bottas out of the pits, they release him right in front of Verstappen. So Verstappen just gets blue flagged past him, holds Bottas up so his tyres degrade. So Bottas pits. But he also does an incredible thing of purposely locking up, going through the stadium sector to really screw with Bottas's lap behind him as well. And then. But I'd argue, is that not just a, a moment or an event no, in no, a Grand Prix rather than the Grand Prix is an does entirety. it again. Because Mercedes then pit him again, put him on yet another set of soft tyres. And Which... sit there going nowhere to wait for the window. And Verstappen comes around again and does it. Eventually Bottas gets it on the 69th lap. By now he's two laps down, which was actually just a great foreshadowing of the rest of his Formula 1 career. Two laps down in P15. Um, so it... it, it f- it was a great I ask you, aspect, though, but I don't. Yeah, was it a good race? If you had the P four, a a that, but also before the major jumps If you hadn't watched it back, would you have remembered? No. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, nothing sort of springing to mind as well, especially Formula One related there. So, like all I can remember from last year's race is Perez going. Whoop. And then I have to go back to the previous year, and I think that was Magnussen going to a wall. That may have also been last year, I can't No, remember. that was also last year, I think. Which means 2022 was not memorable. I have no idea what happened there. Max probably won. Yeah, he did, by so, yeah. 15 seconds. And Ricardo was P4, but that was last year in qualifying, I think. Um, so 2022, not memorable. 2021, if Jesse hadn't looked, we've got no idea. 2020, was... don't think they didn't went. run, COVID. Um, 2019... Stuff probably happened. Twenty twenty one was it a uh, Red Bull one two as well? No, Red Bull one three. Perez came P three. Hamilton P two. I think because I just re- kind of remember the celebrations. That's yeah, I mean, like, Ham- like Hamilton's won a title or two in Mexico, and yet I'm pretty sure he's won at least one of them. I think there was a massive amount more celebration than normal. But again, I don't think the race itself was memorable um 2019 hamilton had the chance to win the world drivers championship at this grand prix for the third year straight if he outscored his only remaining title contender valtteri bottas by 14 points or more uh he did not he uh, bottas came from p3 and kept the title going till brazil i think that year but yeah there's something interesting because we, we have so many grand prix like we say and yet you try and look back over a season. I think you and I were talking about this in the Austin review, Jesse, about how to order some of these races in terms of how from best to worst. And um, admittedly, friend of the podcast, uh, Jacob and I, we do keep track as this season goes on. But if we didn't do that list from the get go and we tried doing it halfway through a season, we'd need to be doing what you've done for Mexico 21 and go right, we need to go watch the highlights because I can't remember what they all happened here. Hmm. Just thinking in terms of shortening a calendar or swap, swapping one venue out for another, I like Mexico. It doesn't mean that we should keep going back there. Make things a bit more memorable in our brains, but then at the same time, it is a Wednesday. Yeah. I don't feel like that's impacting the last seven, eight years of the Mexican Grand Prix. <laughs> yeah, but it's impacting our memories right now. <laughs> well, maybe we need to go back. I think to, like, you were fighting. I think losing that battle early on, though. Maybe we need to go back to like the history of the Mexican Grand Prix. We need to just have like stray dogs. Is that not telling in itself though? Yeah. I if don't that's know. the level it gets into Bernie t- and a territory there get the sprinklers out. Or just yeah. like a baseball stadium. Have a baseball game going on whilst the race is going on. To be fair, I've watched a baseball match. So little baseball happens, you could quite easily run a Formula 1 Grand Prix through the middle of one without actually causing any disturbance to the baseball that's happening. Like, the, the, it's you could speed up a game of baseball by simply sort of cutting out all the little bits in the middle and you'd be left with a perfect 20-minute sport and that would be it. But somehow, it seems to take nearly two and a half hours. I don't know. Um hmm. It's a good question, though. It definitely poses one on sort of 
if it's not genuinely memorable, why the hell are we still bothering? But then every now and then you get a circuit that chucks out one that's like truly bonkers and you go, that's why. This one will be just do it every other year. That way you sort of, do you double your chance or do you halve your chance of it being crazy? Assuming you, you pick don't the mind that it's skip. not on the you don't mind it's not on the calendar. So then, if it's bad, you don't mind because it's just gone back and you have that nostalgia and that uniqueness to it. But if it's good, you love it, and then by the time it comes around again in two or three years, you are actually excited because last time we got something good and we didn't and we skipped all the boring stuff. Look at Mugello as the perfect example of that. We got a bit of a crazy race there, not gone back since. But if they said, "Oh, we're going to go back next year," hmm, I'm open to this. We would need Roman Grosjean and Antonio Giovinazzi's plow into the back of the field after a safety car restart, though, to make Mugello quite as exciting. I will I mean, admit that bring, with just, both just, of my favourite drivers. Just bring K-Mag back or bring Stroll back. And, uh, something like, we've got other drivers who can do that. Oh, so. we'll still have Stroll. That's not in question. He can bin it into the kitty litter wherever you put him. And he did so at Mugello when we had him there in 2020. Well, there we go. Then. We, don't need, we don't need the others. <laughs> we've got other kamikazes. I would like a sort of circuits to change around every year it makes it fu- it does make it fun be like, oh we're going to Portimao this year I don't think America but... should have 11 squillion I think they should be forced to pick one circuit that hosts the American Grand Prix and it's drawn oh, out do it like they used to do with Europe you have um, a European Grand Prix you have an American Grand Prix which should be or then you just have another Grand Prix that's in America but that one maybe changes it's Vegas one year get rid of Miami because we don't need it but then you have Plenty of other perfectly good circuits. Road that, America. Some of which Vince wouldn't Glenn. require Laguna Seca. Don't require too much effort to make them grade one spec for F1. Just saying. Yeah. That's a good theory. Anyway, we've got the Mexican Grand Prix to come. But of course, it is known for being a high altitude circuit, thin air and unique aerodynamic setups. Teams running different blanking plates for brakes, different front and rear wing angles, and usually specific floors as well. It's often described as being technically a bit like Monza. Um, So with that in mind, we'll lay down some predictions. And it's a two versus one when it comes to pole position. Timo, you're the one with Sergio Perez. If it's his last Mexican Grand Prix, might as well give him something. So we're, we're bookending these predictions with Sergio Perez, as we'll get to in a minute. So I thought I'd start off with pole position for him. If the rumours are to be believed, it could be his last Grand Prix. Oh, it'd be so unlike Red Bull to do that to a driver. They're not really known for this recently at all, are they? No, they wouldn't do that. Not twice. Well, especially considering we're in the middle of a triple header, we'd have to sort of compress the Daniel Ricciardo time frame. And, 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 not, and not in a situation where it makes absolutely no sense PR-wise. They'd not. No. no. They, would, they would do it before the Mexican Grand Prix. But again, we're in that compressed time zone, so it will happen before FP... FP it won't be an FP1 driver. It would just be his replacement. Go, Congratulations, Isaac Hadjar. Don't get out of the car. You're doing FP2. <laughs> Why is Daniel Ricciardo in that Red Bull? Yeah. What a twist. <laughs> Just... Do you think Red Bull would make it out alive? Uh, no. Just, oh my oh. god, who's that with the metal folding chair? It's Ayumu Iwasa. Oh my god. Just out of nowhere, just Red Bull drivers popping up. You're sort of going, what are they doing? Very purple Barney the Dinosaur just emerges in the stadium like, you forgot about me, didn't you? <laughs> in all your drivers switching around. Well, or what if they just gave someone else Sergio Perez's helmet and race suit? They'd have to be of similar height, wouldn't they, do you think? I don't think yeah. it's a tricky height to replicate. Yeah. Or they do what uh, Top Gear did with the Stig and the American Stig and you stick his dad in the car and just hope no one notices, but then this suited larger person comes walking out. <laughs> like, yeah, or like... Perez every... looks a bit different. Or every time James May had to do a race in Top Gear versus Top Gear from other nationality, and they just sort of happened mm. to have James May in a white suit and white helmet. We just happened to have a slightly better driver in a Sergio Perez helmet and race suit. And that, uh, yeah, I suppose if they're accruing points under Sergio Perez's race number, the points go to Perez and Red Bull. Mm. Too bad he's already out of. Oh, yeah, too bad he's already out of. Um, Championship contention. Anyway, Ellie May, you and I are sharing an idea for pole position. Yes, we have gone for Charles Leclerc. Um, Such a passive aggressive we there. We. We. Well, I picked it first. 
I just copied it because he's so amazing with these predictions. There we go. That's what I wanted to hear. Moving on to the podium. Um, we've all gone for a Ferrari win. Um, and then after that, it gets a bit chaotic. Um, Timo, we'll start with yours. And then we'll go to Ellie Mayers. Yours are both the most straight-laced. So you've taken the high nature of Mexico to mean high on drugs, considering your choices. High um, on speed and success. No, marijuana. Charles Leclerc, for me, for P1, though, Piastri P2, and because it's his 400th Grand Prix, and because you never know with Mexico, some cars behave just a little bit differently there. Fernando Alonso, why not? So you're allowed to pick something a little bit differently, but I'm not. Yeah, yeah yes, because that's still feasible. You have gotten out uh, by entertaining notion, but uh, a bit of the old uh, spliff is going on there, I think. Uh, no. For anyone who's listening who might be a potential employer, no. Uh, Ellie May, your He's not cool, positions. don't employ him. He's not doing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's the that's the reason I'm not cool. Uh, Ellie May, your podium position predictions. Uh, I've gone for Carlos Sainz win, Charles Leclerc second, and Oscar Piastri in third. Although I am going to have to maybe start taking out Leclerc because I can't say his first name very well. I'll say Charles. Charles. I, can, I can sort of say Charles, but like I ha- it the Somerset starts coming out a bit. Oh, the I'll just say Charles the then. Is that? No, because that Charles is worse. <laughs> yeah, oh. it, it, it's the R sound. <laughs> okay, it's option three. Me. Option three, you have your own nickname for him. Call him Francis. No, Chuck. Chuck. Chuck Leclerc. Yeah. Well, yeah but then him... he sounds like a beefy American. I mean, That's... that was perfectly Chuck... fine when they had, um, what's his name, doing Chucky it Leclerc. in um, Miami that time. Uh, Willie T. Ribs. Yeah, but... I feel like he gets away with it because he's Willie T. Ribs. Yeah, this what is very true. I, what if I just go by his middle name? One of his middle names. Just go Mark Percival. 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 Percival Leclerc. Well, that is his call sign when he's with flying with the French Air Force, so it is relevant. Well, there you, but there you go, you see? Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, my podium is Charles Leclerc win, Franco Colapinto second, Lando Norris third. I would love to see Colapinto on the podium. I'm not against it. It'd be a right laugh. If he's going to do it, he's going to do it at one of the sort of races that's a bit closer to home. And um, yeah. A I way th- to deny Lando points. Yeah, a great way to deny, deny Lando points. Also, I believe that would uh, mean he overtakes Alex Albon in the standings. So that would be quite. No shit. As well. It's a P2. Of course, he would overtake <laughs> him in the standings. <laughs> Yeah, but how many like, constructors would they then overtake? Um, They'd get back past Hass, I think, and RB that they're currently behind, but only just. What'd you get for a second? I forgot. So that would be 18. What, 86, 18 points. Yeah. So assuming that, like, uh, where. Aston Martin would be paying Franco a lot of money to say thank you for not making them sweat quite as much as they are at the moment, considering how close. Yeah. Um, so that Hass would. Are to them. Williams are currently on 17, so 18 points would essentially double their tally, uh, taking them to, I've got to do maths now, 35. Yeah. And that would see them one point behind Minardi and uh, three points behind Haas. So, so interesting. Which then makes things awkward when Magnussen gets his P2 and Abu Dhabi. Mm, a little. But we'll see how that pans out. Meanwhile, checks notes. Colapinto is currently on five points, so plus a further 18 would take him to 23 points, which would put him just behind Lance Stroll, ahead of Yuki Tsunoda, uh, which would make him P12 in the standings, which is quite good. So I'll say this, if this comes true, you and you specifically are then responsible for Yuki getting fired from RB because that will put him ahead and he will replace him next year. And it will be hilarious because of all the people to have caused it, it will be you. And I will laugh my ass off. That is very sad. Back. That is very <laughs> sad. Uh, oh, well, it's locked in now. Fast yep. slap. Oh, you chosen, Eddie, mate? Fast slap. I've gone for Lance Stroll. You reckon he's finally going to do it? Now that he's got yes. the record for most races without a fastest lap, he's actually going to get the fastest lap. He just wanted the record. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. 
Fair enough. That was my whole entire thought process. Just so in sync. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Timo, Max Verstappen. Yes. It's yeah, straightforward suggestion. Uh, I meanwhile have gone for Kevin Magnuson. I reckon the Hass is going to be pretty nippy in a straight line. Kevin's got nothing to live for. Why not? He's got nothing. I mean, I'm pretty sure he's got a wife and kids. <laughs> yeah. I meant that in terms of, sort of the rest of the championship. I realised as I said that that was entirely the wrong phrasing, but nothing to drive for, maybe. That there we are. That's a better phrase. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know. Her has had a fastest lap before. I want to say yes. I don't know why. I'm going to go with no. We're just not in sync today. No, we're not in sync today. We'll try again. We'll try again on Monday. They've had two. Mm. Jesus. Mm. Uh, she, she's got a Kiki Rosberg. I've got a, I've got Hess. You know, <laughs> it's just yin and yang. Uh, okay. Uh, would you like to take some guesses as to when they Grosjean in France, twenty eighteen? Grosjean, um, France, twenty eighteen. Wrong. But you're in the right I year. I think it'd be right to be honest. Yeah, I was going to say. 2018. God. It can't be Baku because that never happens. He says waiting for confirmation that it's not Baku. Not Baku. Um, Where the hell were we in 2018? Mm. Germany? Uh, No. (laughs) Spain. Bless you. Spain? No. All right, but now give up. No, we said France. Uh, um... Both times it was the same driver. Remember was it Grosjean? Grosjean? No, it wasn't Grosjean. I, Magnussen. Yeah, it was Magnussen. Uh, both in 2018? Uh, one was 2018, one was 2019. Silverstone, Monza. No, no. Spa. Singapore. Timo got it. Singapore both times, both times Kevin Magnuson, both times finishing outside the points and getting fastest well, lap. Of course it was Kevin Magnuson. Daniel thought I would just beat it. I read this. Oh, damn, that's why my mind finally got there. Excellent. Yeah, 2018, he finished 18th and scored the fastest lap. And in 2019, he scored the fastest lap coming home P17 in Singapore. So slowly getting better at Singapore. Thanks. So, actually, my Kevin Magnuson fastest lap makes a hell of a lot of sense looking back on it now. Anyway. Um, it would have made sense if we were in Singapore. Yeah. Amusingly, the race that he wasn't in. Oh, no, sorry, that was Baku, wasn't it? That was it? Baku. He was back for oh, Singapore, damn. but didn't oh, so the close. chaos, so chaos close. we were in. Just, that's the thing, like, it's all out of sync, so maybe he will do it in Mexico. Mm. He's got to catch I up. Was just, I was just thinking, Eddie, if we end up in, a, in any kind of an F1 quiz, we're going to be a good team. we got you on the history, me on the modern stuff. We're sorted. I mean, Jesse, you bad, can sit in the corner. Too bad we might be hosting an F1 quiz as opposed to taking part in it anyway. Um, I'd really like do it. really well, then. <laughs> mm. Can I take part in it instead? Uh, <laughs> d- no. You'll get your own questions. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll give you your own little table and your own set of questions. Um, wild predictions. And this is where, well, my ones are already pretty wild, but things get wilder still and genuinely wild. Um Actually, yeah, for this, Ellie May, I'm going to allow yours. Of course, it's mad. When's the last time it happened this year? Saudi Arabia? Uh, He must have podiumed more recently than Saudi Arabia. (laughs) (laughs) Must have done. Furiously checks notes, China. (laughs) Oh, yes, that's so much uh, nearer to us on the timeline. By three races. Um, yes, but also China. Yeah. I've gone for Sergio Perez is on the podium. That's a wild I'll, prediction. I'll, I'll allow it. But do it anyway. Well, Who are you? Who are you to say what I can and can't do? Well, I'm just thinking he's in a Red Bull. It's like the third fastest car on the grid. He should be in with a relatively decent chance of getting onto the podium. Timo. It's Sergio Perez. Yeah, that's also the other half to it. So I'm sort of torn. If it's Sergio Perez, therefore... It's not likely to happen anyway. Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. You're allowing it. I, I'll give it my hand wave. Just, just, just to cover Eddie May completely, 
will you also allow it if he goes on the podium representing the constructor as the winning team? <laughs> <laughs> because it's the only Grand Prix where you could see that happen oh. considering it's Mexico. <laughs> No, no. See, the bomb, do... he's just he, he just a toe of his gets on the podium. I get the point. He's sort of got younger sibling syndrome, so he's allowed up just so he doesn't get upset. Like, oh, it's like it's not his birthday, but he's allowed to blow out the candles, sort of thing. Um, he still gets a present. You're, yeah. Um, if he ends up on the podium representing Red Bull, the constructor, that will be allowed. Um, what I will also allow is if, like for Zhou in China, they give him his own special little pit board to park in front of, that will also be admissible. Well, I was thinking it'd be something along those lines, or like when Weber scored points uh, for the first time in Australia, even though he wasn't on the podium, they still got him on there because it was an absolutely wild thing to happen at the time, considering the point structure. Because wasn't he racing for Jaguar at that time? Something like that, but it was like P5, P6, oh, yeah. I think, in that Grand Prix, and uh, everyone went nuts. Mark Webber, racing driver, let's just check. Well, he's a racing driver, you don't yeah. need to check. Well, no, there are other people called Mark Webber, is the problem. It was his first Formula One Grand Prix, he finished fifth mm. with Minardi Asia Tech. There so, is um, yeah. an Olympian rower for Germany called Mark Bieber. Which amused me during the Olympics. Yeah. But anyway, there we go. Um, That's going to be one of her questions on the top quiz. Who is the German version of Mark? What Webber? Olympa likes, like sort of, we take Formula One drivers and find their sort of similar named corp in on the Olympics. Um, actually, that's a good idea for a quiz. Um, Timo, your wild prediction. It's going to be this one. I can feel it. This, this is going to be the race that they've been preparing for all year. Where stake are not only going to get points, they get double points. They've been fine tuning this car for the altitude, for Mexico, for all of it. It's going to be here. I can feel it. They're relying on a Ferrari engine rather than sort of their own. That and the fact that it is a green car. And that, as we all know, means that they will get double points in Mexico. That's just how the rules work, anyway. I don't make them. There is the colour green on the flag of Mexico, so that does tally up. He's put some thought into that theory. But so is Aston Martin. Wrong shade of green. Yeah. I've been saying that for years. It needs to be greener. Um, meanwhile, my wild prediction is neither Mercedes finish in the top ten. Ellie May, I just want to check, are you allowing that as a wild prediction? Hmm. It's She's just thinking. as we're marking each other's work. Yeah. Keeps it fair in parity. I mean, bear in mind that at what, like the start of the US Grand Prix, neither Mercedes was in the top 10. So uh, it's... If only that's how predictions work, at the start of a Grand Prix. Yeah, but I'm, I'm predicting at the end of the Mexican Grand oh, Prix, yes. neither will be in the top it's 10 It's been weird well. to predict it for the start. I... I mean, if we'd make a prediction for every lap, we'd be here for ages. Mm. I think I shall allow it because I'm kinder than Jesse. Thank you. I wasn't allowed yours. I was being kind. I allowed yours. Brought fact and discussion to the matter. I tried to make it a talking point for a podcast where we talk about Formula One. Otherwise, it's just sort of say thing, yes, say thing, yes. Not a dominant thing. Yeah. Anyway, with our predictions laid down, of course, Mexico will be the Grand Prix to watch this weekend. Whether it's interesting or not, we still don't really know. It'll probably be what's the weather going to be like? We haven't done the weather forecast for a race for ages. Let's see, probably Mexico, because we've got all of them. City, Mexico City. Come on, give me some. A little bit windy, and then snow. Uh. I don't think I'll ever be able to go and watch the Mexican Grand Prix due to its altitude. What oh, I just thought you were going to Mexico. No, well, that too, but I reckon my ears would get a bit funny. I think it is not so. They sort of adjust after a while. Um, 
Friday, 23 degrees after a cloudy start, sunshine returns. Saturday, a nice blend of sun and clouds and 22 degrees. And then Sunday, nice with intervals of clouds and sunshine, 22 degrees. Uh, relatively steady wind by the look of things, 9 to 11 kilometers an hour, all roughly in the same direction. So, uh, yeah, we shall see how the Grand Prix pans out. Now we know the weather, now we know our predictions. That is all we've got time for on this week's episode. In the meantime, if you want any more from any of us, Timo, where can you be found? Well, Jesse, you won't know this, so I've not mentioned it, but I do also do an IndyCar podcast, and we recently did a 2024 season review. So that is now available over on Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. So do go and um, be across the pond sports network. And uh, there was also a Nitro Cross podcast out with all the fun action from Salt Lake City. So uh, two other good motorsport series if you get bored of Mexico over the weekend. Wow, an IndyCar podcast. You haven't mentioned that one. Mm. Yeah, that's, no. a new one. that's a new one on me. Ellie May, where can people find you? Or would you rather they didn't? Well, I was going to say, can you stop being the stalker, please? Yeah, stop stop finding Ellie May. She doesn't stop like it. Me, please. No, she's That's talking it. to you, Jesse, specifically. <laughs> no, there's there, there are people she's referring to when she says that. and <laughs> <laughs> That is a surprisingly long list. Have you got anything that's coming up? Well, s- hang on, hang on a second. Are you saying she's not someone worth stalking? I feel no, like I'm saying she is, and there is a list of people that are. Um, so maybe it'd be worthwhile me not telling me, telling me, telling, telling people, people where, where you are. Yeah, don't, yeah. don't, don't give out your home address. But have you got anything that's maybe coming out on Instagram that people might want to go and what, look what, at? What, whatever she says, place. just leave it there. <laughs> no, I think. I'll, I'll just say leave me alone please internet anonymity for this week that's perfectly fine and in the meantime if you want more from me you can of course pick up the latest issue of classic car weekly uh this one's got my mg in it actually this has got the story of me putting the new engine into it which did only last 400 miles i um, thought it'd be on the uh the kind of the back pages where you're trying to sell it sell no, the not just yet um i haven't got to that stage of emotional detachment from it just yet or you're, uh, or you're donating it for a new series of scrappy challenge I would never subject it to that level of pain. Um, Very well, frank on you, though, I've just had an idea back. for that. Please don't do that. Well, yeah, car. they're waiting for you to donate your car, and oh, they can no. do it. That's the missing oh, piece. No. Um, <laughs> and then they'll drop a grand piano on it. It's not a Morris Marina, although I did contemplate buying a Morris Marina. He'll never ever you deserve sell- what's coming. <laughs> He'll never ever sell it for the fact that Aunt Anstead has worked on it. Yeah, I've had I've had famous TV mechanic and Anstead help me rebuild the brake system on that car. Um, anyway, yeah, if you want more from me, Classic Car <laughs> Weekly. Yes. Um, apart from the handbrake, that doesn't work very well. The gearbox works perfectly, and the clutch did until. Well, the clutch still works fine. Um, I'm just waiting for the day when he opens the door, and it is like that Top Gear episode where it was it Clark's car, and the door still somewhat in the car. Oh, the door skin is still inside it. It <laughs> yeah. was built near Birmingham, so that is a very real possibility uh, in the 70s. Um, but anyway, yeah, Classic Car Weekly. Find me on the internet as well at Jesse on Cars on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. There's usually stuff appearing on there. And of course, thanks go to all of our listeners, but this week, especially those in Oaxaca, Mexico. If any of our listeners there fancy sending us a bottle of mezcal, it would be warmly received. Although I drank a significant amount of it last night. Couldn't attest, very nice. Especially when mixed into a Negroni, lovely. Um, Otherwise, thank you very much for listening. Ellie May is battling a fly, and we'll see you again after the Mexico Grand Prix. (laughs)